Hi, my name is Abhilash Majumda. I am a research scientist working for Morgan Stanley. Uh, previously, I used to work for HSBC Holdings as a machine learning NLP engineer. Uh, I have worked previously with Google Research on the language models, uh, particularly in uh, And I have been mentoring uh, professionals and students uh, on machine learning, AI, um, and NLP from different uh, organizations like uh, Udacity, Udemy, Upgrad. And so in general, I have been working on this mentorship uh, opportunities and tasks for quite a long time. And um, to find, you can find the links in the comment section in the description below. And um, so welcome to Co-Learning Lounge YouTube channel. So today I will be explaining you uh, the intricacies of RNN, recurrent neural networks. Uh, also make sure to subscribe to this channel because I will be uploading uh, different uh, interesting videos on transformers, attention, and other sophisticated things related to NLP. Um, in general, also you can comment uh, if you find something interesting, helpful, uh, and also feedbacks are welcome. So uh, let's get started with, with what recurrent neural networks are. So uh, recurrent neural networks um, generally refer to a class of uh, neural networks which work on recurrence relations. These a set of neural networks are, are vastly used uh, mainly due to its uh, re memory retention and also it can capture lots of information uh, from a particular uh, classification tasks or any tasks in general. Particularly in the field of NLP, uh, RNNs have made the breakthrough from a long time. So in the, in the context of sentiment classification uh, to image captioning, everywhere we find that RNNs are always there. Uh, albeit in the present times, these are present in the form of sophisticated architecture, but the basic form of recurrent neural networks are still persistent even to this day. Now, why do we need recurrent neural networks is because um, when we are talking about, uh, particularly in the field of NLP, when we are talking about uh, context uh, of a particular sentence or a particular word uh, in a sentence, we generally need to refer to what words or phrases are present uh, forward to that particular word and backward to that particular word. That means we want to capture the context of a particular sentence, right? And in that case, uh, our recurrent neural networks perform the best. They have this different activation units inside them. They have uh, recurrence relations which allow different, uh, based on certain time steps, they allow the memory to capture all the sufficient information required for a classifier, generic machine learning classifier or any NLP classifier to perform its tasks. So sentiment classification is by far one of the most, um, you know, uh, most applicable genres of recurrent neural networks because they have been used extensively in this aspect. And um, in, in other contexts, when we come to language translation, where we want to convert from one language to another language, let's say English to French or French or vice versa, we can generally uh, get to know uh, more about recurrent neural networks and how they can optimize uh, by understanding different contexts present in different languages uh, and also analyze them. So in this example, we see that there we have a French corpus and then correspondingly English corpus. So with the help of RNNs and all the you know, sophisticated architectures which are currently in present, um, we can generally translate from one language to another and this has greatly enabled us to build a scalable and highly, um, like having a very high throughput of RNNs. So RNNs are, can be used for mapping inputs to outputs of various types, lengths, and are fairly generalized in their application. So details of this recurrent neural networks. Now, when we talk about recurrent neural networks, uh, we generally uh, can think of it as a very sophisticated multi-layered perceptron or a multi-MLP in general. So what happens in NLP is that we have an input which collects the input features and we apply some kind of uh, nonlinear activation units uh, on it, on, on that particular inputs, and we get the output of that, uh, of those input features. And these nonlinear activation units can be anything ranging from uh, sigmoid, softmax, prelude, and these kinds of activation units um, are present to allow some nonlinearity in the input features. Now, when we have a deep network, when we design a deep network with uh, just basic MLP, uh, we, uh, there is effectively no memory retention or there is effectively no uh, you know, memory um, present uh, which can capture sufficient information from a particular text or a particular uh, NLP corpus. Uh, so that is where the 
uh, recurrent neural networks comes into the picture. Now, if we if we were to unroll a recurrent neural network, we would be able to see that um, a classic diagram, which is present here, that we have word input, right? And we apply certain activations in a series of steps, one after the other. So if we have a particular word, let's say word one as the input, uh, an activation comes into the picture, which, which gets applied on W1, that is the word vector input. And the output of that particular activated layer is the input to the next layer. So in this way, there are lots of hidden layers in between in, uh, in an unrolled recurrent neural networks. But all these kinds of things often happen uh, because we are unrolling a recurrent neural network. But if we were to design an RNN from scratch, we would be thinking them as similar to a recurrence function, which can be viewed in this example over here. You can see that we have an input sentence or an input feature vector, and we are passing it to a hidden layer. Now that hidden layer has an arrow loop which is which is uh, which is a self loop, and it is running back to itself again. This implies that the intermediate parts, that is the intermediate hidden layers of a recurrent neural networks, are following some kind of recurrence. Now, recurrence is a general uh, rule in computer science when we want to apply uh, a, a function which which is almost similar as uh, which which ranges actually based on certain time. So, for instance, if time equal to t zero, the function uh, has a value of n the time equal to T1, uh, you know, that same function will take the value of N plus some added features. So the every uh, at every timestamp, some of the input features of the previous timestamp will be, will be present as input features. So recurrent neural networks apply this concept only. Now, if in a, in a general recurrent neural networks, since this is a neural network topic, there are two broadly different kinds of things which are happening. So one is a forward pass, which, which computes the weights and the biases of the input features. And then since this, we are performing supervised learning, then we compute the entropy, then we compute the loss that we have a, either a categorical loss or a binary loss. We compute the errors and we try to back propagate through the recurrent neural network. And this is where the performance enhancement uh, comes into the picture. Now, in this case, we will be talking about the forward pass in this, in this mechanism. Now, typically a recurrent neural network in detail uh, appears like this. You have an input feature, which is X, and it passes to recurrent neural network unit, which is a self loop on it, and then it provides the output. Now, in this case, we have a four letter word that is hello. The first four letters, that is H-E-L-L, -L, and uh, we will ask the network, that is the RNN network in the forward pass to predict what will be the next letter. So here, the vocabulary of the task is just four letters, that is H, E, L, and O. Now, in most of the language uh, NLP situations, this prediction is what gets uh, output, it becomes the output in a general classification tasks. Now, if we were to design a particular RNN, so that would look pretty much similar to something like this. Um, if we consider the hello example, at time step t, if we if we just pass the first four letters, that is h e l l, then we in the time step t equal to one, that is the next time step, we will be passing e l l and o. So at each time step, we are just picking what will be the next character from it. So if we write this in a recurrence formula, it becomes h t equal to f of h t minus one comma x t, where h t is the new state and h t minus one is the previous state, while xt is the current input. Now we have a previous input instead of the input itself, because in recurrent neural networks, the input neuron would have to be applied on the transformations of the previous input. At, that means at the time step t equal to t1, what was the, uh, the outcome is dependent on the time step t equal to t0, that was the previous output. So in this way, the recurrent neural networks try to uh, apply this uh, in a sequential manner, in a sequential uh, recurrence manner. So if we were to take this simple example where we have ht equal to f of ht minus one comma xt, and we will be applying some kind of nonlinear activation on it. Now, the design of this is very similar to what a multi-layered perceptron is. We are applying a linear activation, which is given by this equation over here, ht equal to tan h of this. This is a particular weight matrix that is given by whh times the ht minus one plus whxh. This is another weight, weight matrix with xt. So effectively, we get a, uh, a coupled uh, equation having a nonlinear activation unit called as tan h. And we are having some associated weights 
the weights are associated with the ht minus one that is the previous state and also the xt that is the input state so we have two different kinds of weight vectors over here the whh and the whxh corresponding to ht minus one and corresponding to xt respectively now this is the internal layer of a particular uh, recurrent neural network now if now if we want to compute the output that is the y in our figure this y in our figure we have to just apply the output that is the ht we have to apply some weight on it so in many cases this is the most simplistic output where we apply a weight that is why on top of the um, uh, output of the previous layer that is ht or we can apply a nonlinear activation on this so either it can be yt equal to some nonlinear activation times this why times ht or it can be simply as why times ht so if we were to summarize this entire step of how recurrent neural networks work so a single time step of the input is supplied to the network that is the input feature which is in our case the xt we then calculate the current state using a combination of the input features the current input and the previous state in the previous state if we, if we have the first time step then the previous step will be zero so initially we calculate the ht now the current ht becomes ht minus 1 for the next time step so this is how the recurrence pattern is followed in recurrent neural networks and we can go as many time steps as we want as our problems uh, define that and we can combine the information from all the previous states so in this way we have a recurrent flow of uh, inputs and recurrent flow of weights and biases at each step of the recurrent neural network uh, now once all the time steps are completed the final current state is is gives us the yt that is the output now the output is then compared with the you know the predicted that is the actual output just as in the case of normal supervised learning right and then we can uh, do the back propagation to uh, calculate the, to uh, change the weights to update the weights to make the difference or the error as small as possible now in this case let us take an example to see how the forward propagation or generally referred to as the forward pass takes place in an rnn so in this case if we take the first four letters of the word hello h e l l so we see that this is a uh, you know uh, a tensor right having zeros and ones effectively this is known as a one hot encoded tensor right and in this case you can also get to know the dimensions of this so it has only one column and uh, four different rows pertaining to the ones and zeros which are present in it now one hot encoded vectors are effectively very uh, they give very sparse matrices or very sparse tensors because only one element is one and the rest all the elements are zero and let us now initialize uh, our two weights that is whh and whxh if we remember in our equation that we have we have two weights one is whh and one is whxh now we have to initialize those weights now let us initialize them randomly as it is done over here so whh is defined by this tensor having these weights corresponding to h e l and l right and then we have uh, for for the letter h and for the hidden state we also need whxh right so by matrix multiplication which is given by this equation whxh into xt we get we multiply whxh into this h that is the first letter and we get this as the output this uh, decimal values or the this decimal tensor as the output now this completes the first step where we have calculated the forward pass for h now if we move to the recurrent uh, network or the recurrent neural network we also have to calculate the whh which is another one cross one matrix now we have to take some bias now it is recommended to take some bias in most of the cases but for our case we uh, if we remove the bias then uh, our recurrent neural network for the first step will only output zeros why this will be is as follows because for the letter h the previous state is 0 0 0 because h is our first letter and if and for the first letter the previous state that is the t minus 1 state is effectively zero because h is our first state that is the uh, t equal to 1 so for t equal to 0 the effectively the everything will be zero so when we calculate the weights that is the whh into ht minus 1 is biased effectively this part whh into ht minus 1 we are effectively multiplying this um, the, uh, this tensor that is uh, 0 0.427 multiply it with this tensor that is ht minus 1 because ht minus 1 is 0 
the WHH H two H T minus one also becomes zero. Effectively, what we are uh, what we are left with is just the bias. So if we keep our bias as zero, we can get to know that you know for the first step everything will be zero. This particular part that is W H H into H T minus one, this part will effectively be zero. So the output of the first one will be zero. But if we were to keep some bias, in this case we have a bias of 0.567, so that bias will get added with zero to give some initial values that is 0.567. Now the step three is we have to add these two, um, you know, the outcomes of these two uh, mathematical equations. That is this part, this tensor over here, and this tensor over here, uh, because we have computed W H H into H T minus one, and we have also computed W X H into X T, right? And now we have to add them, which gives us these tensor of values, these tensor of floating point numbers. And then we have to take some nonlinear activation on it. In general, in recurrent neural networks, we are mostly concerned with tan h uh, because tan h has some important properties of memory restoration and, mem and capturing a lot of member uh, information from textual corpuses. That is why tan h is mostly suitable. And there is another mathematical importance of tan h because the second derivative of tan h dies down very slowly. Now, if we were to do a derivative of tan h of a function x, the first derivative would give you one minus x square. And if you were to do the second derivative, the second derivative will not will would not be you know extinguished at a very faster rate, and that is where you know the tan h can attain or hold information for a longer time period, as compared to other activation units. Now tan h has almost similar features and looks similar to a sigmoid function. Uh, it is almost it it almost has a kind of a shaped curve, but it has different limits and different bounds as compared to sigmoid. And um, that is why tan h is more appropriately used. And the step four is we have calculated the ht by passing it the output of these internal mathematical equations through the tan h activation unit. Now, the next step is to compute the yt. Now, if we were to compute the yt, the yt is, is pretty much very, very simple because we just have to multiply a weight that is hy, why, multiplied that is with the ht. Now, WHY is effectively the weight that is, uh, you can either initialize randomly, which is in our case, um, this has been initialized randomly, or we can initial, initialize them using some activation units, using some predefined uh, formulas, or you can initialize them as zeros or ones, anything can be done. And we multiply it with the HT that we have received from the previous step in our case. So this gives you the output of the entire recurrent neural networks for a particular timestamp T. So we can see that for particular timestamps t, we can effectively uh, take the information from t minus one, and we are, can also predict what will be the output uh, or the next character in a particular sequence. Now this uh, steps four and five gives you an illustration of how you know the uh, how the next step comes into the picture. If we are taking the next letter, that is uh, e after h, we can also see that in, in the computation of the word or, or the letter e, we are taking into consideration the details that we have covered while calculating the values for h. So in this case, for each individual character, we are evaluating the characters, uh, the details and the computations done on the character just before it. And also for all the time steps, starting from zero. So in this way, recurrent neural networks try to build a kind of a um, you know sequential network where you are calculating a particular uh, output at a particular timestamp t equal to t1 based on a certain previous timestamp that is t equal to t1 minus one. That is one timestamp before. So in this way, the forward pass gets calculated. Now, if you were to build, uh, 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 we when we get the yt, we effectively get a, a series of probabilistic values. We get a series or a tensor of decimal values. Now, if you want to apply some sort of classification context on it, we generally refer to some activation units on those or an activation function on those output labels. Now, that becomes, uh, in most of the cases in RNNs, we use softmax function for that, where we transform the yt to a softmax variant or a softmax transformed output. And this gives you a, a, a classified uh, probabilistic values where you can have certain values like 0 0.5, anything above 0 0.5 gets classified as one or anything below 0 0.5 gets classified as zero. So in this case, you can have um, uh, probabilistic values of what the output. So this can also be used for predicting what will be the next character given a particular input character. So let's say in the word hello, we have seen that H-E-L-L -L is written. What will be the next character that will 
that will succeed L, that is the last step. So in most of the cases, after sufficient training, we will we'll be seeing that O, the, uh, the particular character O will, will succeed L. So in this way, using this softmax activation at the output, that is softmax of yt, we can effectively get all the range of probabilities for the from the which gives you the most probable word next next character and the least probable next character. And we can generally use this uh, this thing as a classifier, or or you can use this as a generative recurrent neural networks. In this context, we have given the example of. Uh, character level RNNs, we, where we have, where we are applying this RNN concept or recurrent neural network concept uh, on particular characters in a particular word, but the same concept can be used in the case of uh, words as well. In a sense, a word level RNN. And next concept, since this part is generally the, considered as the forward pass of the first step, next part we will be going towards the back propagation. For this back propagation, we will be moving towards the next tutorial, where this is given in WI, uh, D, WILTML artificial intelligence blog. So this is given really well over here by Danny Brits. So in this case, we will be seeing how back propagation takes place. Now we mentioned that recurrent neural networks generally have two kinds of passes. One is called the forward pass and one is the backward pass. Now the backward pass generally takes place uh, due to the fact that we want the errors to be reduced and we want uh, very clear and crystal outputs, which are almost very similar to the actual or the predicted outputs, predicted labels in most classification contexts. So in this case, since we have a time, uh, uh, time space in consideration, so we can also consider we can also label this as back propagation through time because we'll be seeing how recurrent neural networks actually actually apply gradient descent and gradient flow through time uh, which was not in the case of normal multi-layered perceptron or dense networks so if we if we recollect we can see that uh, this is a variant of the same equation that we saw where we have uh, tan h of the input features whh into ht minus one plus xt into wxh and then we apply um, a softmax of the output uh, if we if we recollect in the previous blog which we have, we have we have seen now we can also define our loss so our loss can be binary loss or it can be categorical loss so if we if we just consider our cross entropy loss that is uh, we can just frame it as a very simple equation that is given by summation of yt into log of yt y cap t where y cap t is the softmax activated variant of the output, RNN output in the forward pass. Now, typically an RNN happens like this. So uh, S0 for the S0 input, you have E0 as the output, X0 as the input figure, and this gets forwarded to S1, which takes as input the S0, that is the previous timestamp, right? And it takes X1, that is the uh, input at the current step, and it also gives you an output for the current step that is E1 and is and a part of the output is also fed to the next layer that is the X, S2. And this is how the RNNs takes place. Now, if we were to consider the back propagation over here, we want to do something called as chain rule differentiation. Now, chain rule differentiation is the, the intuition for using differentiation is because generally we are trying to optimize, generally we are trying to optimize a curve uh, in a high dimensional plane by finding the minimum. Now, why do we need the minima? Because we want to reduce the amount of errors. We are effectively using this loss function that is given over here, our uh, cross entropy loss as our uh, uh, effective loss function. And we want to minimize the error on this particular loss function. So in this case, we want to um, find the minima for the particular curve. In general, in calculus, if you want to find the minima, we generally do differentiation. And in this case, we want to do differentiation with respect to the weights because we want to update the weights for which are present in our loss functions. So in this case, uh, we will be going through the gradient descent algorithm because the gradient descent is the most basic algorithm. And there is another variant called the stochastic gradient descent, where we sum up the errors for each of the time, you know, uh, each of the descent states, and then we update the weights. Either we increase the weights or decrease the weights depending upon our, uh, uh, upon our errors. So generally, the rule becomes DE by DW, where D is the error and DW, W is the weight. Uh, we have a summation of DET for DWT. Now, we have mentioned that back propagation through time effectively takes place through time. So in this case, we are doing all the summation of the weights in stochastic gradient descent through time. So this is how the back propagation algorithm works through time. Right. 
Now, uh, if we if we consider this equation very closely, we want to calculate the derivatives with respect to v because v. If we if we see this equation, we have a softmax of v times the st, where v is a weight. Now, if we were to apply this uh, gradient descent differentiation on with respect to uh, v, we have to do chain rule because directly e of e of three is not a function of having v as an input or an input feature. So we make the chain rule um, in this case because we want to first do derivative of e three with respect to y cap y cap three, and then we do the derivative of y cap three with respect to v because v is just in case present as an input feature in y cap three, but e three does not have that. So in this case, this is why the intuition of chain rule comes into the picture. We first do the derivative with respect to y cap three, then we do the derivative of y cap three with respect to z three and z three with respect to v. Now, what is z three? Z three is nothing but the v of s three, right? Because v. So if we are understanding with the chain rule concept, the chain rule is if a function label is not present in a particular equation, then we cannot do derivative with respect to that particular label. So Derivative with respect to that equation, and then we again decompose that equation into further steps until the smallest part contains that particular label. So that is what the equation comes into the picture. So dE by dy cap three, and then we do this chain rule. Uh, we make the functions, uh, you know, having the same common part that is the v, and then we back, then we apply this chain rule again with respect to dz three and dv. So effectively, if we if we were to do this in our own notebooks, we will be able to see uh, and understand it in a more clear manner. Similarly, in this case, we do the derivatives for w. If we recollect, w was also a weight, w h h and w x h. So for these two weights also, we have to do partial derivatives. That that means the chain rule. So d e three by d y cap three, and then d y cap three by d s three, and then d s three followed by d w because. In the in our case, we uh, d y cap three does not have any input feature with respect to w. So in this case, we have to first do the derivative with respect to s three, and then only we can move forward with d s three and d w, where s three is given by the tan h of the input features that we saw earlier in the forward pass. And this step of back propagation and gradient descent actually uh, actually continues. And this is where the summation of the weights with respect to the different timestamps it comes into the picture. So, if we were to do with respect to dW, we can see that this chain rule actually elongates in a very long table, long chain. So, we have d e three given by uh, d uh, y cap three, and this chain actually goes on until we get d s k by d w. So, um, this is where one of the important drawbacks of RNN comes into the picture, as well as one of the most important uh, facts of having an RNN. So you can see that if you if you continue doing applying partial chain rule on these equations, the chain rule equation becomes very large, and this is continued through backpropagated through time at for each time step. This is pictorially represented in this case. So you have when we go from e4 to e3, we see that first we are doing the derivatives with respect to d e3 with respect to d s3. And then we are taking the outputs for that, and we are back propagating it to S2. So we are effectively taking the derivative of S3 with respect to S2, and then we are again taking the derivative with respect to S2 with respect to S1, and then this process continues until we reach the source. That is the first step. That is the S0 step. So this process effectively continues for all the time steps that we see. In recurrent neural networks, we just saw. To summarize, we saw two things. First is the recurrence pattern, where we have an equation, a tan h activation activated equation of weight vectors multiplied with h, that is the time step, plus the input features x t multiplied with some uh, weight vectors uh, w x t, and then we apply tan h on it. And after that, we have to get the output for that uh, recurrent neural network in the forward pass. We compute the y t, which is given by the softmax activation of the v t dot s t. So in this case, if we just go back to a previous equation, we will have w h y cross y t h t. So in this case, we get the y t by having in the forward pass. Now in this case, we also want to do uh, minimize the error. So in this case, we first devise the loss function. In our case, that is the cross entropy loss that is given by summation of y t into log times y cap t. And then we want to do partial derivatives because we want to perform minimization or gradient descent to minimize our errors. Right, and that is where the back propagation through chain rule through time comes into the picture, and this is the effective equation for back propagation where we have d e with respect to the weights with summation over time, 
And in this case, if we expand this equation, that is the chain rule differentiation equation, we will see that this equation of expansion is getting really large. And that is where the intuition for having these kinds of uh, gradient descent for each time step comes into the picture. So for in this, as we can see in this image, first DE3 with respect to S3 is computed. The output of that is computed is again done derivatives with respect to S2. That is again done derivatives with respect to S1. And this process actually continues, right? And uh, if we move forward, we have a vanishing gradient problem in RNNs, which is a very uh, hard problem because uh, if we if we recollect using this equation where I mentioned that there the chain rule differentiation equation actually becomes large, and this is effectively done shown in the picture over here. So if you have thousands of units of recurrent neural networks, recurrent neurons, one after the other, you can see that the gradient is computed at each and every step, and when you are computing gradients the gradient actually becomes very, 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 very small at each and every differentiation step. So it becomes literally very uh, hard to know whether the gradient, uh, whether the gradient drop is there or not. In most of the cases, the drop becomes so, so small, so, so minute that it becomes impossible for the uh, weight update to take place. So in that case, the weight update becomes really, really small and the learning is not improved. Learning does not improve as the epochs uh, go on. So in that case, we are left with something called as a vanishing gradient problem where the RNN does not capture any information, any more information, and there is uh, something called as a damping of the uh, of the weights that is taking place because the weight updates are not taking place because the gradients are, are very, very small, are negligible in, uh, in, uh, in numbers. That is where, you know, some important features uh, like LSTMs and GRUs uh, come into the picture, which we will cover in the next few topics. But in this case, uh, this is the drawback of the RNNs because of the chain rule becomes really large. It becomes difficult for to understand uh, where the update is taking place. And uh, effectively, in in the in the concept of tensor, this is computed as a Jacobian matrix, right? And um, in this case, this Jacobian matrix is effectively a matrix uh, done by the differentiation of all the individual weights present in the particular uh, tensor or a particular matrix, right? And uh, this particular equation is a uh, unrolled version of this particular equation where we have a product of dsj given by the dsj minus one which is effectively the loop from here as we increase the number of layers inside neural layers we can see that this step continues for a longer period of time and this is where this particular part um, actually tries to uh, decompose the weights um, and uh, the gradient is not properly attained the gradient change is not properly attained and there are several resources. This paper uh, also has uh, provided in this link also has uh, a, a very mathematical detail as to why uh, this gradient, vanishing gradient problem comes into the picture. And that is all mostly what I wanted to cover about uh, recurrent neural networks in general. So to, to summarize, recurrent neural networks are highly uh, sophisticated neural architectures, which, which can be used for sequence classification, sentiment classification, any NLP tasks in general. And they form the base for all the advancements that have been there current uh, in, the, in the present time instant. So they use recurrence relations. They use the information from the previous time steps. And there are two passes. One is the forward pass, where we compute the 10 each activated uh, input features uh, coupled with the previous state inputs. And we get the output of the, so uh, of the forward pass, which was softmax activation of the inputs. And uh, there we design the loss function, which in our case is a cross entropy loss. And we try to optimize the, that loss. We try to find the minima of that loss because we want to minimize the error. And in that case, since we are doing supervised learning, we have to compute the back propagation. In RNNs, the concept of back propagation through time comes into the picture where we are trying to design a, a neural network where which can compress the gradients through time for each and update the neurons in a, in a, in a, in a timely manner. So, uh, and that is where the vanishing gradient problem comes into the picture where uh, the effective gradient uh, change, since the chain rule differentiation equation becomes very large, the change in the gradients is not very clearly observable and the weights are not clearly uh, attained. The change in the weights are not clearly attained. So in this case, that is all that I wanted to cover about recurrent neural networks. Um, for in the next sections, we will be covering about LSTMs, GRUs, and all uh, modification, modified architectures and how they can, fall, they can solve this uh, vanishing gradient problems. And thank you. And I will be seeing you in the next video tutorial.